Hello and welcome to the Lionel Curtis podcast. I'm Timothy Ridout and I'm a violist and I'll be talking about the legendary violist Lionel Curtis together with Nick Breckenfield. Hi Nick. Hi, hi. I'm Nick Breckenfield from the Bolletti Batoni Trust. I was going to say, um, tell us about that piece. So uh, j- just firstly, I'd just like to say th- a big thank you to the Bolletti Batoni Trust for, for making this podcast possible and for supporting us today. Um, that piece that we just listened to was the first meeting by Eric Coates. Um, For those of you who haven't come across Eric Coates, he was a viola player, but more well known as a prominent composer of light music and of film music. Uh, You probably have come across the the movie, The Dam Busters, for which he wrote the famous Dam Busters March. Uh, Now, before becoming a composer, Eric Coates was a viola player and a viola student, and he studied the viola at the Royal Academy of Music in London, where his teacher was the great Lionel Tertis. Now that's a name you're gonna hear a lot today. And I think that he is really the, the, the father of modern viola playing and someone who's done more for the viola and the viola repertoire than anyone else. And there's a beautiful story behind this, this piece, First Meeting. Um, it was composed around 1940 uh, during the Second World War. And Tertis, who was already 64, 65 years old, in his mid-60s, had retired from the viola. But he went round to the Coates' house where Eric Coates was there. Eric was also a fine pianist and his son, Austin Coates, as well as uh, Eric Coates' wife, Mrs. Coates. And there was a performance, just an informal casual performance in the sitting room where Tertis played the piece first meeting. And he enjoyed it so much that he played it again uh, straight away. Um, sadly, the piece was never published in its original form because Tertus had already retired and without a champion, the publisher worried that it wouldn't sell copies. So it was arranged for the violin and then published in that format. But just recently, uh, not so long ago, John Wilson made a version which he believes to be the original form. And the, the, the way he knows that it's the original form is because he had a chat with Austin Coates who remembers vividly the sound of Lionel Tertis's open C string, which is the second note that the viola plays. So it's been put back into its original key of F major. And I think it's an absolutely gorgeous showcase of, of the viola, the instrument and what it can do. And you were the potentially the first person to play it since Tertis on the viola. And that was at your Wigmore recital. Um, uh, we're talking just before Easter, a week ago. Um, uh, and so we might have had a first meeting with Lionel Tertis that was a world public premiere. That's true. In a sense, I, I mean, the viola players have played the, the violin version, which is in, mm. in the wrong key, but, but back in this original key, which really brings out the sonority of the instrument, this is possibly a, a first meeting with this piece about 80 years after the piece was first composed. And uh, that quality of the viola you mentioned there, Tim, Yes. Um, it has a, a dark, warm quality, um, which is immediately recognisable and, and uh, is evidenced in, in the opening of, of Coates' piece. Yeah, well, f- for those of you who haven't come across the viola as an instrument, I mean, the, the viola sits in the middle of the string family and it really has its own unique voice. For, for, for a long time, it was kind of thought of as the, the sort of downtrodden uh, little sibling of, of the violin. But actually, it, it has a, its, its own character, a dark, rich sound, which, which can have joy, but also melancholy. And, um, and Tertis really understood this, I would say, better than 
anyone else and convinced so many composers to write gorgeous works to, to really showcase this this beautiful sound quality of the viola of the instrument which which I love so much uh, it's it, it it's as if it became a lost instrument because obviously Mozart knew um, mm. uh, the qualities of the viola uh, in the famous Sinfonia Concertante, which yeah. Curtis has a history with. Um, uh, so and obviously Berlioz uh, and and Paganini who um, uh, commissioned Berlioz for Harold in Italy, but it's really in the twentieth century and with Lionel Curtis. Um, and others, William Primrose, etc., um, that the viola finds its own voice. Yeah, it's true. Funnily enough, I mean, of course, the viola has always been an important instrument uh, in chamber music, and many of the great composers did play the viola. Uh, for example, Mozart, uh, Beethoven, also um, Dvorak, they, they all played viola in chamber music, but there's relatively few solo pieces written. I mean, if you think about how many Mozart piano concertos there are, and then there's five violin concertos, mm. but there's just the one Sinfonia Concertante, which we share, mm. which I'm not complaining about. I mean, it's a, <laughs> the most wonderful piece, but, um, but, but there was a much larger output for the other instruments. And I think there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, but Tertis, in a way, came along as the first real champion of the viola. That was really his passion, that there had been had been other people who, who had done important things for the viola, who maybe we can talk about another time, but, um, but just the, the wealth of music, which, which you can trace directly back to this, this man, Lionel Tertis, is, is vast. Now, when did you first find out about Tertis? Goodness, when did I first find out about her? You know what, actually, um, I started to play the viola when I was eight years old and that was because there was a concert at my school where all of the local peripatetic teachers came to play a short piece and uh, funnily enough the viola teacher played the theme from from Harry Potter uh, and, and I said I'll do that one and not knowing an awful lot about the viola at all but I went home and my parents who were musicians had a book of uh, all sorts of uh, kind of musical encyclopedia and there was a page with the viola and there's a picture of Lionel Tertis sitting there prominently with his beautifully kept moustache and his viola in his hand so I think that's probably the first time I saw his face but but it, it didn't mean an awful lot to me I guess the name came up more and more during my teenage years when I started to to research repertoire I mean particularly uh, virtually everything from a British composer written between 1900 and 1950 you can trace back to Tertis. I mean, it's really remarkable, and as well as composers on the continent. Um, so so he, uh, his name started to come up in, in the sort of dedications at the top, and then I discovered some of his recordings, which are fairly difficult to get hold of, but uh, beautiful sound and approach to the instrument and such a care for, for sonority. But you also have a connection in that you won the Lionel Tertis viola competition. That's true. Yeah, I I was the the winner of the Tertis competition uh, in 2016, a competition which was established, I believe, in 1980 uh, to celebrate the life of of the great man. He he was born all the way back in 1876 and died in the mid 1970s at the age of 99, um, and his widow lived on until 2009, I believe. But it, it was her together with. With, with some other people who set up the Tertis Foundation and and they they started this this competition which funnily enough takes place on on the Isle of Man and has become a, a huge event in the viola calendar happening every three years uh, or er, normally um, and so yeah I was very uh, yeah very happy to to win that competition take part in that uh, experience the Isle of Man yes. Um, there's a funny story about why the competition is there, and I, I don't want to get the story wrong, but the, they they actually started, the, there's a man there at the music centre, they have a, a music centre in Port Arin, where the competition takes place, and they originally started the competition as a double bass competition, N nothing to do with Tertis, and there's an amazing video of lining up about 80 double bass players on the beach, uh, and, and they, they got some great footage and photos, but... Um, it turned out that it's quite difficult to fill a tiny island with double basses. And it was, it was around that time, shortly after Tertis died, that I think uh, somehow the connection was forged 
with the Tertis Foundation, and they really wanted to set up this in his memory. And there was already a kind of a template of a competition put in place. Um, and so that's how it ended up being that I, I don't know if Tertis even went to the Isle of Man. He quite possibly did, but I don't think it was a significant place in, in right. his life, actually. Now, I know with the competition that um, there is uh, um, a, a work specially composed that all, all um, competitors have to play. What was it in yes. 2016? Um, in 2016, the, the, the commission was from Stuart McRae, oh. and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. I think it was called Fenordery, which okay. was a kind of piece about a little imp-like creature, a sort of mythical thing. I think it's to do with Manx folklore. Uh, which was very difficult and jumping between time signatures and all around the instrument. Um, and so that was the commission that year. And I think it's really, I mean, a lot of competitions these days have a new work, but particularly thinking about Tertis, the amount that he he commissioned in his life, um, he, he was a, a real firm believer in, in expanding the repertoire all the time. I think he said something like, uh, when you become a viola player, you have to expand the repertoire by fair means or foul, and well, so he was. Yeah. Well, well I was. I was just going to say that I I, I counted up uh, the number of works associated with Tertis in John White's biography, and wow. it, I think it was two hundred and ninety-seven. But I might have wow. miscounted a few, and that's yeah. pretty good going. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really it's incredible, and and uh, as well as those sort of key works that we associate with Tertis he made a ridiculous amount of transcriptions of small little pieces for the violin or for the piano, which I suppose he included in his recitals or as encores mm. uh, all over the place. So it's it's really vast, vast output. I mean, he even, he even did a, um, uh, a piece by Szymanowski from the opera King Roger. Right, um, yeah. Uh, and, and it turns out it, it came to his mind because Szymanowski came to London. Um, right. Uh, so the, the the connections uh, are you know a legion um, for, yeah. for him. So yeah. tell us a bit about him then. Um, about Lionel Tertis. Where where should I start? Um, uh, where where was he born? Well, he was born in in West Hartlepool um, in the north of England, and both of his parents were were immigrants. I think his his family his father's family was Russian and his mother's family uh, from, from Poland. And they kind of uh, escaped, the Jewish family um, kind of escaped Poland in the mid 19th century because of this sort of growing anti-Semitism, uh, which was, was prevalent there at the time. And they settled, I, th I think quite happily in, in, in England, although Tertis didn't really grow up in West Hartlepool, just when he was just a, a child, I think about three months, uh, old, the, the, the family moved down to East London, to Spitalfields. And so that was where he grew up. Um, his father was supposedly quite a fine tenor, a singer at the, at the synagogue, um, sort of, uh, I, I don't know the correct word, but a kind of cantor. Mm -hmm. um, and and so he he had music all around him. And so I think the family was very keen for him to to, to pursue a life a life in music, although not at the viola. The viola came way, way, way later. Um, he actually started off on the piano. Um, and I believe that he was around just three years old when, when he started playing the piano. And in fact, he was just six years old when he gave his public debut, dressed up in a little um, a little suit in, in North London in Highbury. He gave a piano recital. Um, and, and so th that was the start of his musical life. But supposedly, as a as a kid, he he detested practicing. So his parents would lock him in a room uh, to play the piano, and he would just, I suppose, sit there and play the piano. There were no smartphones or Instagram uh, for distractions back in the the eighteen eighties, um, and and I suppose he progressed quite quickly. But it was fairly soon that he he decided he wanted to play the violin, uh, but he had no money to do that. So so when he was thirteen. He left home with, with the blessing of his parents and he went to Scarborough, I believe, where he he was um, he was a pianist accompanying uh, a blind gypsy violinist. Um, so so he worked there as an accompanist. And the, the reason he went to work so soon 
was so that he could earn some money to go and have violin lessons. So this carried on for a while. And then I think he went down to Brighton for another job as a pianist. Um, and he saved up his money and got those violin lessons that he wanted. And so a few years later, he entered Trinity College of Music, um, which is where he was studying as a pianist. And I think he played piano concertos while he was there. So I imagine he must have been really quite competent as a pianist. Um, and then he took second study violin. So even at that time, starting so late, he was still just a second study uh, violinist. Um, but I think the, the violin really was where his his passion was. The sort of the the sonority already of the the string instrument was so important to him. And he, in uh, in his words, he said the piano was far too mechanical for his for his liking. Um, so I think by and by he became more and more of a violinist. Um, but money ran out uh, fairly quickly. Just after a couple of terms, um, he had run out of money. So at that point, he he needs to get on the job. And so again, the work was as a pianist because that was the place to get work. So he ended up working for a lunatic asylum um, up in Lancashire, where he was um, a sort of music therapist, but the, the, the role included sort of changing the patient's clothes. Um, and so it was by no means a smooth a smooth path to being this eminent uh, violist commissioning things and traveling to America and Europe. Um, so after saving a bit more money, he went back to study at Trinity and complete, a, I think, a third term. Um, and then he, he was looking for more. Uh, so he went to Germany. He enrolled in the Leipzig Conservatory, uh, where he didn't enjoy his lessons at all. He said that his professor was a sort of avid stamp collector and would just sit at the other end of a very long drawing room uh, examining his stamps and sort of tell him to play it again. Um, and so that, that experience wasn't great. So he came back to the UK uh, and that's when he entered the Royal Academy of Music. Um, and I think that's a real turning point in his life uh, because I think then he was really focused on the violin at the Academy. And his teacher was Hans Wesley uh, who was quite a, an eminent violinist, uh, Austrian or, or German, I'm, I, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but um, settled in London and, and a very important violinist at that time. Um, and it was during those years that he met um, a, a friend. I mean, I actually made lots of friends, but, but one in particular suggested, Lionel, why don't you try the viola and then we can start a quartet together? And he described that experience of trying the viola as kind of love at first sight. Um, and, and that, that was really the start, that, that sort of casual suggestion of why don't we play a quartet together was the start of this lifelong love affair with the viola. I was thinking, uh, well, I, I'd read that um, he was uh, appalled at the quality of viola players that he'd come across. And that if he, uh, if you wanted to perform uh, uh, in a string quartet, the viola players around were just not good enough. So in sort of, uh, in annoyance, he grabbed the, the viola and thought, I'm going to make this work. Yes. <laughs> well, and, and he, he very much did. He, he very much did make it work. I mean, yeah, the, the viola supposedly was in a sort of dreadful state uh, apparently when he was in the royal academy of music there was one old man uh, who was hired to come and play the viola in in the academy orchestra and the principal uh, sir alexander mckenzie described him as a necessary evil um so that was the the kind of state of viola playing and I, i'm sure that he had this fighting fighting spirit which stayed with him for his whole life well i i, I found a um, a quote from arnold Bax. Oh. that I thought gives him, uh, 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 shows the sort of character that Tertius was. Yeah. And this was um, with reference to the uh, um, sonata for harp and viola that he wrote. Right. And um, he, he obviously got quite irritated with Tertius's exacting standards. Um, so he, he, he says he received a characteristic note from Tertius complaining that Gwendolyn Mason cannot play in time until she improves. He refuses to play my sonata with her, <laughs> 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 which I thought uh, you, you get uh, an impression that he's quite a feisty character and speaks his mind.
Yes, for sure. I, I think he was actually a fairly small stature, um, but a very, very strong fighting fighting character who definitely spoke his mind. There's another story about him, actually. Um, I think in the 1910s or 20s when he went to America um, and uh, supposedly he, he, he found out that the financial conditions weren't as, as agreed. And so he immediately returned to London. <laughs> um, Without doing any of the concerts? Well, so seemingly, I, I, I don't know. It's hard to tell how, how, how accurate the records are. There's also, by his account, um, he, he wrote a book called My Viola and I, um, where, where he summed up his life, this autobiography. And he says that he joined the Queen's Hall Orchestra at the back of the second violins. And within a few weeks, he became the principal viola, which is kind of a bit like a, a viola joke. Um, and, and it's a bit hard to find the, the exact evidence to back this up. But definitely, he was very feisty. And if he wanted to achieve something, he, he absolutely did. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, we're, we're, he's, he's, he, he's in the string quartet at the, yeah. the Friends College, yeah. um, uh, at the Friends at the Royal Royal. Uh, college um royal academy uh, royal academy yeah um and he he's on the verge of a professional career then yes exactly so this is the part where where he started to to to, to make a career but i think it wasn't wasn't so straightforward at the beginning um but w within a couple of years he found himself in the position of principal viola of the Queen's Hall Orchestra under Henry Wood. And he says that he learned a lot uh, from, from that experience, working with Henry Wood, working in the orchestra. And a couple of years later, there was an experience which definitely changed his life um, and his attitude to music playing and the instrument. And that was when Fritz Kreisler visited the orchestra to play the Beethoven Concerto. Um, Fritz Kreisler, of course, being the great, uh, the, the great violinist, possibly the greatest of of his time of, of the late 19th century, early 20th century. And he was famous for being the first person to really employ a lot of vibrato um, as well as portamento. Um, and, and that absolutely captured Tertis. Um, and so I, I'd like to play you a short extract of Chrysler himself playing um, and this, this sound which attracted Tertis so much. We're going to listen now to Chrysler himself performing Dvorak Humoresque. So that was Fritz Kreisler playing Dvorak's Humoresque. Um, and I think that that sense of sound and phrasing and vibrato uh, hugely, hugely influenced Tertis. And um, 
remember that there was there was no viola professor around at that time so Tertis basically taught himself I mean he'd had violin lessons um but he, he really worked by himself to cultivate a sound, to cultivate a style and to cultivate a technique. Um, and then went on to become the first ever viola professor of the Royal Academy, at the Royal Academy of Music. Um, and so, yeah, that, that beautiful extract of Chrysler playing, I, I think is something that really struck. So as I mean, nowadays we're so used to hearing playing with, with vibrato, but I think it, for most of the 19th century, Portamento was the main expressive style and and vibrato was a fairly reserved thing and Chrysler was the first person to employ a more or less constant vibrato which changed the the sort of way of music making completely completely so um obviously uh Tertis was in influenced by Chrysler but then yeah. Tertis influenced lots of other people and particularly a string of British composers. Um, Hugely, yeah. I mean, it, I think well, once you got a, a 20 or 30 years later into the 1920s and 30s after uh, Turtz had taken up his professorship, one, there were just so many composers who wanted to write for him and two, he had populated the London orchestras with highly competent viola players. So I think he he not only changed the, the sphere of viola playing, the sphere of viola repertoire, but also the, the sort of orchestral sound uh, definitely here in Britain. Um, and so it was really quite, quite remarkable um, what he achieved. I mean, uh, his students included Eric Coates and they also included Rebecca Clark, but also during that time at the Royal Academy of Music, he forged a friendship with the young pianist Edwin York Bowen. Um, and th they went on to become duo partners. Bowen was a, a hugely virtuosic pianist who played concertos regularly, uh, often at the proms, um, and composed a lot. And because of the partnership with Tertis, he wrote quite a lot for the viola. He wrote two beautiful viola sonatas, a great viola concerto in C minor, um, as well as lots of short pieces, uh, viola and piano, viola and harp, viola and organ, uh, via, four violas, he, you name it, he, he wrote it. I mean, he was really so inspired by, by Lionel Tertis. Um, and uh, Arnold Bax? Arnold Bax, of course, uh, another one uh, who, who I think, again, that they met through the Royal Academy of Music. Um, then there's also Vaughan Williams, mm -hmm. uh, Arthur Bliss, um, a whole plethora of of composers. In fact, a, a bit later on, I mean, uh, Tertis played in the premiere of the Elgar Piano Quintet and also the Elgar String Quartet. Um, and he was really seeking out Elgar to write a viola concerto, which sadly never happened in the end. But Tertis made a transcription of the cello concerto, which got the blessing of Elgar, Edward Elgar. Mm -hmm. And they performed it several times with Elgar conducting and Tertis at the viola. So that sort of in a sense, uh, became a part of the repertoire, thanks to Tertis. But no recording? Um, Tertis never recorded it, yeah. sadly. Um, some people have gone on to record it, and I, I hope to also record it myself at, at some point. Um, yeah, but this is, sadly, I, uh, except the Mozart Sinfonia Concertante, I can't think of any other recordings of Tertis with orchestra. Uh, there, there's quite a few with piano and some of chamber music as well. I had a partner, uh, a musical partner, Albert Sammons, who was a, a, a great violinist of his time. Um, and in fact, uh, go, go, going on to, to composers and colleagues, I'd, I'd quite like to play you a, a recording of Tertis and Sammons together um, because uh, the, the, both wonderful players and you can hear their, 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 their approach to sound, their approach to phrasing. And this is the cadenza for Mozart's Symphony Concertante, which Tertis himself wrote. And it's so different to anything we'd hear here nowadays. Um, so here is Tertis's cadenza to the Mozart Symphony Concertante. Thank you. 
So that was Lionel Tertius and Albert Sammons playing Tertius's Cadenza uh, to the Mozart Symphony Concertante. So when was that recorded? Um, very good question. I'm not exactly sure. That was with Hamilton Harty uh, conducting the London Philharmonic Orchestra. It was sometime between 1926 and 1935. Now, because he stopped, he retired at 1935 when he was 60. That's true, yeah. Uh, for, for the first time. All um, oh, right, okay. <laughs> al although he didn't manage to stay in retirement uh, too long. Um, I think he felt a duty uh, when, when the Second World War broke out to, to share music and was very involved with uh, Myra Hess's wartime concerts. What, at the, um, uh, the National Gallery? Yes. Yeah, so, and, and he, he kind of, he, he couldn't really sit still very long. It's amazing, after he retired from, from public performance, having commissioned so much, having toured several times to the United States, uh, having toured all around Europe, um, then he 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 actually was on the the panel of forming the the BBC Symphony Orchestra, um, and so he was there for all the auditions for all the string players and played a really prominent role in so many different activities in musical life. Did he actually perform in as a, an orchestral music musician in the BBC Symphony Orchestra? Or no, so his his orchestral career ended more or less uh, in about 1904. So he had been in, in the Queen's Hall Orchestra under Henry Wood, and then he was asked to be the principal viola of the newly formed London Symphony Orchestra in 1904. But it was at that point that he decided, I guess he was nearly 30 years of age, he decided that his mission in life was to focus on bringing up the prominence of the viola as a solo instrument and the repertoire. So from that point onwards, he mainly played as a soloist um, and as a chamber musician. Um, and he worked, uh, I, mean, I mean, later in life, he built a, a, a viola. He worked with a couple of luthiers, um, Arthur Richardson being one of the main ones on, on building new models of violas because he was aware that it was quite difficult to find a really good instrument. I mean, the, the amazing thing with the viola is unlike the violin, there's no standardized size or shape. Um, I mean, the, I, I personally play a very, very old Brescian instrument uh, from around 1565 to 75, uh, which has very interesting proportions. Um, but the Cremonese makers made them quite different to that. And, and later on in the 19th century, the instruments are being made different again. Uh, but Tertis, he, he, he was aware of the fact that a larger instrument had more sonority and more depth of sound, mm. especially in the lower register. Um, and so he worked within, with luthiers, trying different thicknesses of the body of the instrument and all sorts of different things with the proportions and, and really opened the question for modern luthiers about the proportions of the viola. Um, I mean, people have mixed opinions of, of these Tertis model violas. Some people are very fond of them. Other people think they're too boomy. Um, but uh, I think whatever you think of them, he definitely opened that, the, that question of, 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 of experimenting with so many other different factors rather than just going for a Strad model or a Guarneri model or a uh, Gasparo de Salo model. Um, so people have really experimented a lot in, the, in recent years, the modern makers, I think so, largely thanks to Tertis. So it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. There are still people experimenting with with viola modeling. Absolutely. I, I think more modern luthiers are coming up with all sorts of different things. There's one amazing luthier, a Japanese guy who builds them kind of with these curved shoulders almost at the top. Um, there's another maker I know of in Austria who makes with a very wide sort of bottom bout. Um, yeah, and I, I think Tertis is, is, is definitely largely to, to thank to all of these interesting innovations um, in, in viola building. And have you played a, a, a Tertis model? Actually, one of my my instruments when I was a student, uh, when, when I was, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old, was a kind of small version of a Tertis model, which was mm. thicker than, than what a viola would normally be. And I, I think it enables for a very sort of small viola to have more depth. I mean, that was kind of, a, that wasn't a proper Tertis model, but it was a kind of mini Tertis, based on the Tertis model uh, viola. 
um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing, sort of all of his his different achievements. Now he's um, uh, he was he, we've talked about his character quite feisty, and uh, uh, somewhat late in life um, he, he married. Yes, uh, was that the second time to a, a younger? That that was the second time. Yeah, so he was married um, originally, and I think he was a very very good and, and faithful husband, dedicated husband on, on all accounts. Um, and at some point his wife's health started to fail, but he definitely uh, stood by her to the end. But after she, she died, I suppose he was probably in his late seventies at that point. Um, but he didn't really <laughs> wait around too long after that. And, um, and a couple of years later, he married Lillian, um, became Lillian Tertis. And he was at that time 82 years old and she was 39 years old. And there's actually a, a, a story of, of them being at Dartington, Dartington Summer Music uh, Festival. And Tertis was teaching there. And Lillian was already in her mid to late thirties, but she was there with her mother. And, uh, and apparently there were bets going on uh, in the sort of staff cantinas to whether Tertis was after the mother or the daughter. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and a couple of years later, they were married and it made, uh, made the headlines in the tabloids, which I find quite amazing, a viola player being in the tabloid news. But, but Tertis has been quite often in, in the news and, and in the media over his career. Um, I mean, the, the, there was one occasion where Tertis had arranged the Mozart clarinet concerto for the viola. And I believe he gave the premiere at the Three Choirs Festival of this arrangement. Mm -hmm. And there was a big headline um, saying, Mozart knew best. And, <laughs> and, and, and someone said to him, Lionel, aren't, aren't you offended the fact that they're, that they're, they're berating of, of your arrangement? Um, and, and he said, no, not at all. I think the viola was mentioned 39 times in, in, in the article. Why should I be, be unhappy? It's such good publicity for the viola. Look how much it was mentioned. Um, and so that was his, his attitude to sort of Knox. Um, and then I, I think uh, this was after his retirement, he had been having this long ongoing dialogue, writing letters in to the, the Daily Telegraph uh, with Sir Thomas Beecham, and I, I can't even remember what they were arguing about now, but there, there was something that they both had very strong opinions about, and there was this back and forth. And I was trying to imagine a, uh, in these times uh, an, an eminent soloist and a conductor sort of having it out in a public forum in, 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 a, in a publish publication like The Times or The Telegraph. I mean, it's, uh, it's probably like, uh, it would be a, a Twitter spat uh, in, in modern times. And, probably, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and sort of get drowned out in all the noise. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, now, we mentioned Vaughan Williams, but we also yeah. need to mention William Walton. Uh, yes. With, um, uh, in regard to um, Lionel Tertis. So, um, yeah. And there's um, a Hindemith link there as well, I think. Um, there is. Another viola player. So. Another viola player. We could spend a few hours doing a podcast just about Hindemith himself. That's the next but, one. <laughs> but uh, that's the next one. Uh, <laughs> if we start off with with, with with Tertis and the Walton Concerto. So I believe that the, the Walton Viola Concerto was written in 1929. And it was Sir Thomas Beecham uh, who suggested to, to Tertis and to Walton uh, the, 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 they should form a collaboration. At that point, Tertis was in his early 50s and William Walton was in his late, mid to late 20s. Um, and, and he took up the commission. Walton wrote a viola concerto for Lionel Tertis, which ended up being one of his most successful pieces and uh, played all over the world in concert and, and also studied by students and in fact used as one of the main audition pieces. If you apply for, for any any orchestra from from a small uh, a, a, a small regional or youth orchestra to the Berlin Phil. That is one of the audition pieces. Um, but Tertis, when he got the music in the post, didn't like the look of it at all. Thought it looked far too modern. There's a lot of false relations where it's kind of bitonal, and uh, Tertis thought it was yeah far too modern. Uh, so he sent it back uh, straight away and refused to play the premiere. Um, 
which actually seems to be a kind of trend for important viola works that the the, the commission e refuses the premier but um but yeah he he sent it back and so paul hindemith actually came along and played the premier of the walton viola concerto hindemith himself was also a, a very competent violist although i believe a very different type of player to to Tertis. After the premiere, Tertis realized that Walton's 1929 concerto was in fact a masterpiece. Um, and so he took it into his repertoire and went on to perform it quite a bit in the next few years. Although sadly, there's there's no 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 recording of Tertis playing it. Um, although I have, I, I've played it a lot myself um, and I would like you all to, to be able to hear uh, this this gorgeous piece. I mean, the, 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 the lyrical, opening which kind of floats over the orchestra I, I think would have perfectly fitted Tertis's sound uh, so here is a recording um, of myself playing the Walton Viola Concerto this was from a concert back in 2019 um, with the Tonhalle Orchestra Zurich and the conductor David Zinman So that is the opening of, of, of the Walton Viola Concerto there. And you can hear how, how lyrical it is um, and, and how well it would have fitted Tertis's lyrical style of playing. Now, Walton, you can compare and contrast with Vaughan Williams, who was very much of an older school than, than Walton. Yes, yeah, a, a very different uh, sound world and style of playing to Walton. Um, and so shall we play a little bit of of the the suite for viola and orchestra by Vaughan Williams So that was the 1934 Suite for Viola and Orchestra uh, by, by Vaughan Williams, which I recorded a couple of years ago with the Orchestra de Chambre, de Lausanne and Jamie Phillips. Um, it's, it's such an evocative piece. It take, takes you back sen a century at least. Um, yes. Uh, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Um, uh, we've talked about um, uh, very, at the very start, Eric Coates, who was one of his pupils. Um, can yes. we turn to another, uh, Rebecca Clark? Yes. So, um, so actually, I was just told a story about this this piece yesterday. But Rebecca Clark was was a student of Tertis, um, and she wrote a, a viola sonata. Oh, she wrote quite a lot of music, actually. But this viola sonata she wrote in nineteen nineteen won the first prize at the Coolidge competition 
uh, in New York, where she actually tied with Bloch, although apparently she was originally given the first prize outright. Um, and then they decided, because she was a woman, that the yeah. that the, the, the she shouldn't have it on her own. So they decided to tie her with with Bloch. Although both both pieces have stayed important works in the repertoire. Um, although I think I would say Clark's piece is perhaps even more important. Um, so a year later, after writing the, the sonata and winning the prize, she was in London again. Um, and she went to go and see her her old mentor, Lionel Tertis, and she played the sonata for him. And I think it was in May. 1920 there was a concert at the Wigmore Hall uh, where Rebecca Clark played her sonata and Turtis also played in the concert and he played a few short pieces uh, to kind of su support the concert um, and it's gone on to become to become a really important work in the viola repertoire and I feel yeah very privileged to be playing it on that same stage uh, I had a concert at the Wigmore Hall uh, about a week ago uh, in, in this is March 2021 now so it's 120 uh, 101, 101 years yes yeah. 101 years um, later but the same stage the same hall in, in virtually the, the the same setting as it was originally so here is uh, a recording of myself playing that Rebecca Clark sonata uh, and I, I think her style of playing definitely can be linked back to her uh, Professor Lionel Tertis. This is the Rebecca Clark Viola Sonata written in 1919, which she performed at the Wigmore Hall in 1920, and I've performed at the Wigmore Hall in 2021. This is an excerpt from the last movement of the sonata, which is a beautiful uh, melody, kind of like a lonely folk song. That was a clip from Rebecca Clark's Viola Sonata, written in 1919. So, Tim, uh, we've uh, we've spent about an hour talking about uh, Lionel Curtis, and and probably only scratched the surface. Yes. But apart apart from the um, uh, cadenza from uh, the Mozart Sinfonia Concertante, uh, we actually haven't heard a piece That's by true. Curtis. I was so, just thinking the same myself. So perhaps we could uh, end with hearing uh, a piece by him. Absolutely. Uh, so to, to finish, I would like to play a recording of Lionel Tertis playing his own arrangement of a little mini lead by Brahms. Um, and the pianist he's playing it with is a, a lady called Ethel Hobday, who actually went to Vienna in the 1880s, 1890s, and she became part of Brahms's circle there. So she knew the composer well herself. So this is Ethel Hobday together with Lionel Tertis playing Tertis's own arrangement of the Brahms Minna Lead to finish our podcast today. Thank you so much for listening. And I hope you found it interesting to learn about this great legend of the viola, Lionel Tertis. Mm -hmm.